can, can, could you maybe point the thing from time to time? Thank you. Nice. Okay. okay, we're going to talk about helium to start with today. Um, we started helium last time. Um, and then after that, I'm going to start scattering theory. And I'm going to do um, an elementary treatment and then some of a somewhat more advanced treatment. Um, so for helium, the You have two electrons each is um, attracted to the nucleus and uh, they repel each other um, and as usual here in MK units uh, Q squared so the four pi epsilon zero equals um, e squared, where e squared over h bar c is the norm of 137 approximately. Um, so uh, if we take h zero as um, simply the sum e i squared over 2m minus z e squared over r i, i equals 1 to 2, then um, we just are dealing with two hydrogenic uh, Hamiltonians that don't interact. And we can say, uh, if we put one um, if we put one electron in um, the one zero zero state and the other one in the NLM state, then this would be simply uh, with the appropriate anti-symmetry, it would be simply uh, psi one zero zero of x one psi NLM of x two plus minus one to the S psi one zero zero of x two psi N L M of X one. Um, S here is the spin, and uh, S equals zero. It means that the uh, that the spin state is one over root two plus minus 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 plus. So the spin is anti-symmetric, and in that case S is zero, and the space wave function is symmetric. On the other hand, for S equal to 1, the spin part of the wave function is plus, um, is, well, it is whatever it is. It's um, the spin, the, the, the uh, M equals 0 component is uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. But uh, you can also, of course, have plus, plus, and minus, minus. So they form a trip of three different states, spin 1. The spin then is symmetric, and the space part has to be anti-symmetric. And okay. And what we'll see uh, when we look at the first uh, at the excited states of helium, the helium atom, we'll see that even though the Hamiltonian doesn't involve any spin operators, we'll see that the energy levels depend upon the spin. And um, Something like this also happens in paramagnetism. Okay, so the ground state is 1s squared, both in the 1s state. And evidently, if you're going to put them both in the 1s state, then you can't have s equals 1, because that would give you a minus sign, and you just get 0. So you need to have um, s equals 0. And the spin, then, is anti-symmetric. And the space wave function then is um, uh, simply phi x1 x2 is equal to psi 1 0 0 of x1 of psi 1 0 0 of x2. In other words, here you 
which said S equal to zero and LM equal to zero. And so you get the first term twice. And well, then I'm a little puzzled about the normalization here. Anyway, the full wave function is this times one over root two plus minus 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 cross. And that is normalized, so I guess we're okay. I guess what I should have said is that I'm worried about this one over root two, but let's leave the normalization aside for a moment. In this case, of course, the thing is space symmetric, and so this is phi of x1, x2. Now, we actually know what these wave functions are. It's when you multiply the two together, you get z cubed, where, of course, z is equal to two. Over pi, the four radius cubed, e to the minus z r1 plus r2 times this second factor, which is called chi s. So that's the actual wave function. And now you can compute what the energy is. Well, the energy is obvious for h0. That's something we mentioned last time. The energy is simply going to be two for two electrons, a factor of four from z squared, and then minus e squared over 2a0, and this quantity is 13.6 eV. And the whole thing, when you multiply it out, is minus 108.8 eV. The experimental answer is minus 78.8 eV. So just so not doing any perturbation theory gives you an answer that's off by a factor of about 30%. But we, of course, haven't even done first order perturbation theory, which would be to include this term. And when we do that, what we get is delta e for 1s squared, which is the mean value of e squared over r12 in the state 1s squared. And this is equal to a double integral of z to the sixth over pi squared a0 to the sixth e to the minus minus 2z r1 plus r2, because after all, we take psi times psi star. And over a0, and then we have e squared over r12 d cubed r1, I guess, d cubed r2. And so that's the integral we have to do. And, of course, the hard part is dealing with 1 over r12. And this is, of course, 1 over the length of r1 minus r2. And this is a square root of r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2r1 dot r2. And this is, when we rewrite that, it's r1 squared plus r2 squared 
minus 2, R1, R2, cosine, well, in the notes I have cosine gamma. I don't know why gamma, but anyway. And this is a famous expansion. It's the expansion of the Boston with genre polynomials. R lesser to the L over R greater to the L plus 1. And it's PL of cosine gamma, where this gamma is cosine gamma is R1 dot R2 over R1 dot R2. Okay, there's that sum. On the other hand, we can also write this as the sum L equals 0 to infinity, R lesser to the L over R greater to the L plus 1, times the sum N equals minus L to L of Y LM star of theta 1 phi 1, Y LM of theta phi. Okay, this is what makes the Legendre polynomials and the spherical polynomials so useful. And, of course, these guys are orthonormal. There's no angular dependence in this integral at all, except for that due to the Y LMs. And so we're integrating. When we integrate over theta 1, theta 2, that sets L and M equals 0. When we integrate over theta 2 and phi 2, that sets L and M. Well, each one would set L and M equals 0, I guess, because it's the same sum. And so what we wind up with here then, and the normalization is taking into account of the normalization, what we get then is Z to the 6, E squared, 4 pi squared, over pi squared, A0 to the 6. And now we have an integral over R, and we have to keep straight these R lesser and R greater. So if we do R1 from 0 to infinity, R1 squared is R1. Sorry about that. Then we have an integral 0, R1, R2 squared, DR2. And now, of course, we have E to the minus 2Z, R1 plus R2, over A0. And we have 1 over R1, because R1 is R greater. And notice in this sum, the only term we keep is the L equals 0. And then we have the integral from R1 to infinity, where now R1 is the greater, R2 squared, DR2, of E to the minus 2Z, R1 plus R2, over A0. And now it's over R2. Okay, so one has to do those two integrals. And I'm going to just skip the actual integration, I suppose. If I were doing it in actual detail, I might use maple or maybe just an integral table. In any event, what we get then is that delta E1S squared is, putting all this together, we get 16Z to the 6, E squared, A0 to the 6, 5 over 128, A0 to the 5th, over Z to the 5th. And all together then, this is putting in Z equal to 2 and so forth. And eventually it boils down to 5 halves E squared over 2A0. So we combine that with the original expression, which is 8 times minus E squared over 2A0. And we get that as our estimate for the energy of 1S squared. We get minus 8 plus 5 halves 
times e squared over 2a0, and that's minus 11 halves e squared over 2a0, and this is 13.6, minus 11 halves 13.6 dB, and now what we get is minus 74.8 dB, and once again, the experimental value is 78.8. So first order perturbation theory gets us really close, and that's encouraging, but one can go a little bit further by using a variational method. By the way, I've started to put a new homework assignment, homework assignment 4, on the web page. So far, I've only put one problem that's on the variational method, and it's more a conceptual problem than a calculational problem, which I guess is sometimes a good thing. Okay. Questions? Okay, well, what's our variational trial wave function? X1, X2, I don't know what that symbol is in the notes, but let me just call it Z sub E, and it's to write the wave function as minus Z E, R1 plus R2 over E0, and so what this is allowing you to do is, I guess, to sort of mock up the central potential. Remember, the real way to do this problem right is to use the concept of a central potential. That means the integrations have to be numerical. You can't just do them with your fingers, and so you have one electron shielding the other from the nucleus, and I think this sort of plays the rule, those same rules, I should say. Now, P1 squared over 2M in this state is Z E. Notice because of Z E occurring in both cases, we automatically have normalization. This is Z E squared, E squared over 2A0, and what do we have here? The reason why it's Z E squared is that this P means that you have a Laplacian effectively, so you differentiate with respect to R twice, and so you expect that to come down like that. Then the minus Z E squared over R1 gives us minus Z Z E E squared over A0, and then E squared over R1 too. Well, we essentially copy what we got over here, what we had here was 5 over 4 E squared over A0, and that was, but if we put a Z E here, then we put another 2 over there, and so this becomes 5 A's of Z E E squared over A0. Notice if you put Z E back equal to 2, then you get 5 quarters, and that's 5 over 4. So these are the terms that you calculate for the variational method, and you see if you had enough experience with computing the mean value of P squared and the 1 over R in a hydrogenic wave function, then you can actually write those down by inspection the way I did. And so the variational method in some cases can be very easy, and in particular in this case, it was a very easy calculation. The resulting value of H bar is then P1 squared over 2M plus P2 squared over 2M 
minus minus z squared of r one minus z squared of r two plus e squared of r one two. And this, if you just keep track of all these things, we would get this one twice. And so it would give us z e squared and then factor out an e squared over a zero. So that would give two of them. And then we're going to have these terms, and we have two of those. And so that's minus two z z e. And then finally, we have five eight z e here. OK, and so now we said zero is partial h bar with respect to z e. And that gives us z e minus two z plus five eight. So z e is equal to z minus five sixteenths. And that's equal to then two minus five sixteenths, which is one point six eight seven five. And then, of course, you have to multiply by this, which is twice 13.6. And well, I mean, what you have to do is you now have a value for z e, 1.7 roughly. You put that back into here and compute h bar. And then you get h bar equal to minus 77.5 e z. Now that looks pretty good compared to the external value of 78.8. And as I said, this calculation was actually done in 1927. And so that's no more than a couple of years after Schrodinger and Heisenberg introduced quantum mechanics or modern form of quantum mechanics. And so I think it's quite impressive that this guy did his name is A. And when people saw this calculation, they realized that quantum mechanics was a real thing. As I mentioned last time. So any questions? Now we want to do the excited states. And we're, of course, not going to do them in detail. But it's relatively easy to just get roughly what the structure is. So suppose we have one S and then an L. Suppose this is the situation. Then E is going to be E100 plus E NLM plus a delta E term. And what's the delta E? Well, we're going back then to the part of the calculation that got us within maybe 5% of the right answer. In other words, just straight first order perturbation theory without doing the variation method. And in that case, delta E is going to be 100 NLM. And plus minus E squared over R12, 100 NLM plus or minus. And plus or minus will refer to the symmetry of the spin state. And that is to say plus or minus is minus 1 to the S. So if S, if the electrons are in a single state, then they're space anti-symmetric. And then you want a plus sign. And you want the wave function to be symmetric in space. If, on the other hand, it's a triplet state, then the spin function is going to be 
space wave function is going to be anti-symmetric. And so altogether, then, this is an integral d cubed um, x1 d cubed x2 for 1 over root 2 psi 1 0 0 star of x1 psi nlm star of x2 plus, say, minus 1 to the s psi 1 0 0 star of x2 psi nlm. Wait a minute, there's no star there. Well, there is a star. This is just, we're still just doing the first wave function. And then times e squared over r12, and then a 1 over root 2, psi 1, 0, 0, x1, psi, n, l, m, x2, plus or minus 1 to the s, psi 1, 0, 0, x2, psi, n, l, m, x1. Okay, so that's the that's the integral, and that's the first order perturbation theory. And now, what we what we can do is we can separate this into what's called the direct term and the exchange term. So let me do that now. So the direct term is uh, the psi one is, is this one times this one plus this one times that one. That's the direct term. And the direct term, in other words, let me write it this way. Does the index is equal to integral d cubed x1, d cubed x2, psi 1, 0, 0, x1 squared psi n l m x2 squared e squared of r 1, 2. So this is direct. And then plus minus 1 to the s d cubed x1 d cubed x2 and now it's, for example, this one times that one plus this one times this one. And the one over root twos give us the um, give us the proper normalization. So that, that explains the normalization. Um, so now this one is psi one zero zero of x one psi n l m of x two e squared of r12 psi 1 0 0 star of x2 psi star nlm of x1 and this is for the exchange of okay um, and these are sometimes written as i plus minus 1 to the s j alright now the the key observation is that J is positive. Why is J positive? Well, J is positive because we can we can write f of x one as psi one zero zero of x one psi n l m star of x one. And then you can write J as an integral d cubed x1, d cubed x2, um, f of x1, with the star there, e squared over r12, f of x2. And so you see, um, Actually, let, let me do the way I was going to do it. So it looks looks a little odd having a star on the right side. But f of x1 is this term times that star. And then f of x2 star is psi 1, 0, 0 of x2 is 
daughter from the sky and now I am. And um, if you now want to change one or two, it looks more natural uh, or more familiar. But in any case, this thing is positive and this is and it's symmetric. So this is effectively um, a uh, in, in matrix terms, it's a vector, say V dagger, a positive matrix P, a vector V, and this is always greater than or equal to zero. So J is greater than or equal to zero. And that makes all the difference because it tells us what the um, it tells us that plus E squared then over R12 is I um, plus minus 1 to the S J, where S is the spin. And so this level, which is E100 plus E NLM, gets split up by I, which is the uh, direct term is obviously positive. And then this term is split um, by J up or J down. And how does the splitting go? Well, if S is equal to 1, it goes down. So this is S equal to 1. And this is S equal to 0. So this is a single and a trip. And for reasons that totally escape me, um, the triplet state is called ortho helium, and the single state is called para helium. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe what they're referring to is the space wave function. The space wave function is lie alongside each other in the parastate and perpendicular in the, they avoid each other in the in the uh, that, that must be what it is. I was focusing on the spin states. Okay. And in particular gross energy, gross diagram for energy
Okay, so that's that's the, the situation. And so what you see is there's a splitting, apart from the ground state, there's a splitting that would make one think that the Hamiltonian involves spin. And But in fact, we've seen the Hamiltonian doesn't involve spin, but one, one could imagine mocking this up as an effective Hamiltonian, which would be H0 minus some, some fudge factor S1 dot S2, or equivalently to H0 minus some other fudge factor S1 plus S2 squared. Either one would give you a similar, similar factor, where um, alpha and gamma and beta are positive. And as I said, feral magnetism is um, a phenomenon that involves uh, similar interaction. That is to say, it's the spin dependence of the energy states in the case of uh, spin and statistics, the um, symmetry of the wave function um, influences the energy through the spin. Okay, so now we're going to do scattering, and um, I'm going to initially at least um, follow Cohen's and Nugy's uh, approach to scattering. What I like, to, what I like about it is that it's succinct. Um, and the, the reason I like that is that what I've said to you before, namely that scattering theory um, takes on a different form depending on the what the project, what the instrument beam is, what the target is, and what the energy is, and the formalism changes quite a bit. Um, so these notes are long, long. Um, so what we're dealing with, of course, is an incident beam, a target, usually then a, a, a detector, I drew, drew the target as thin, and you can move the detector around. Now this, of course, is a two-body problem, so we're starting out with um, H equal to say P1 squared over 2M1 plus a P2 squared over 2M2 and then minus a V R1 minus R2. And we're going to change this to a one body problem. In other words, we're going to rewrite it as H big P squared over big M plus a little p squared over 2 mu and then well this is a plus sign plus b of a relative coordinate and r here is the way r1 minus r2 and uh, mu is m1 m2 over m1 plus Actually, I don't remember. Does somebody remember what the, is the end of this simple or is it more complicated? Accessible. Um, P is somewhat complicated. Um, and we're going to assume that this is some sort of constant of the motion, which is entirely reasonable because the uh, Hamiltonian is invariant under translations of um, R1 plus R2. And um, so effectively, we're going to be, maybe I should call this H big, 
And I'm going to be talking about H little, which is then just P squared over 2 mu plus V of R. So this will be our starting Hamiltonian. Let me see. Okay, well, what's the cross-section? Well, what we're going to have here in the incident beam is an incident flux, which is so many particles, which is a number of particles per unit area per unit time. So that's the flux. And then we're going to have the number of particles here in dN as, again, the number of particles per unit time per unit d omega, per unit solid angle. And so what one writes is that dN is equal to the flux times some sigma of theta and phi d omega. Wait a minute. I screwed this up completely. No, this is right. So the number coming out is proportional to what? Proportional to the solid angle. And this extra factor here, then, is if we do the units here, this is number per unit area per unit time. And this is a d omega. And so sigma has to have the units of area. So sigma, the units of sigma are area. And over here, if dN is coming out this way, and I've had this completely wrong, it's going to be proportional to d omega. Anyway, the flux is number per unit area per unit time. The number that go into the detector per unit time is proportional to d omega. And to get the units right, then a has to be, sigma has to be an area. One of the units for the unit of the area is the barn, which is 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. And so the total cross-section then, sigma, is the integral of the sigma of theta and phi d omega. In other words, you integrate over solid angle. This sigma of theta and phi is actually often written as d sigma d omega, which follows from this expression here. So it's sort of the derivative of the total cross-section with respect to solid angle. Okay, let me erase this board. Okay, so what are we dealing with? We have h is equal to h0 plus v of r. h0 plus is p squared over 2 mu. That's the kinetic energy. And we're going to be looking for eigenstates of this total Hamiltonian. We're going to write the psi of r and t is some pi of r e to the minus i et 
over H bar. And we're going to be looking at the case where E is positive. In other words, oh, and also we're going to be assuming that V of R is compact in some sense. In other words, that the potential is zero or goes to zero fast as R goes to infinity. And in fact, this is a very awkward point because the Coulomb potential doesn't go fast enough to do the mathematics nicely. And so the Coulomb potential, which is the important case of course, or one of the important cases, requires special treatment. Okay, so what is our Schrodinger equation? Stationary state equation minus H bar squared over 2 mu times the Laplacian plus V of R. Phi of R is equal to E phi of R. So this is the stationary state equation. And we're going to want E to be H bar K squared over 2 mu, which is the same thing as P squared over 2 mu. And we're going to just make the notation simple. We're going to say V of R is equal to H bar squared over 2 mu times some U of R. And then when we substitute for V, we see H bar squared over 2 mu is a common factor. It also occurs over here in E. And so altogether the equation is Laplacian plus K squared minus U of R times P of R equals zero. So this is what we get finally as the equation. Okay, now what do these plus phi of R really look like? Well, part of it is going to be something like E V I K Z. This is going to be the incident theme. Then the part that's the scattered wave is going to be something like E V I K R over R. Now why do we know that? Well, you see U of R goes to zero very fast as R goes to infinity. So we want phi, the scattered part of phi, to be a solution of this equation. Certainly E V I K Z is a solution of this equation with U equal to zero. It's also true that this is, and the way we see that is to compute the Laplacian of E V I K R over R. This is then 1 over R squared P by the R of R squared P by the R of E V I K R over R. And that gives us 1 over R squared P by the R. And this first derivative here gives us two terms, E V I K R times I K R minus 1. In other words, the derivative acting on this R falls down at I K. The derivative acting on this one gives you minus 1 to the minus 2. So the 1 over R squared cancels that one. So anyway, this is what we get. And now if we differentiate one more time. Can you see if I write here? I think so. All right, we get 1 over R squared times I K E V I K R times I K R minus 1. Plus, now we differentiate this term and we get I K E V I K R. So. So what we found then is that the Laplacian of E V I K R over R is just equal to this term here. This term cancels the minus 1 term. And then we have 
an R here, and an R squared, and a minus K squared. So this all together is either minus K squared, E to the I K R over R. And so that tells us that when you bring this to the other side, it's like U equals zero, you have a solution of the Schrodinger equation. So in other words, what we expect is that the, for a given K, the, I don't know why he uses that notation, let me just say, what we expect is a scattering wave function that looks something like this, E to the I K Z plus F, and it's really F of theta C and K, E to the I K R over R. So in other words, this is the scattering, this is our assumption for the wave function for scattering. It clearly satisfies this equation outside the scattering region. When U is equal to zero, it satisfies this equation. And when U is not equal to zero, we assume that psi, that phi has a different form, but that does satisfy this equation. And so this is in the limit R greater than, much greater than, say, R is R, where this is the range of the potential of the R. So this is a long distance approximation. But this is for a specific K. The actual wave function of the whole scattering process is an integral, zero to infinity dK, some G of K, and then this phi of K. Let me write it as phi of, phi sub K of R, and then E to the minus I, E sub K T over H bar. And of course, E sub K is going to be H bar K squared over 2 mu. Okay, that's our expression. And of course, this incident beam is produced by an accelerator, so we expect that this G of K is sharply peaked at wherever the energy of the accelerator is tuned to be. And, okay, so in other words, G of K looks something like this. And now, we can say, well, as we let R be much greater than R0, the psi of R and T is, we can substitute this asymptotic form, and we get two integrals, an integral zero to infinity dK, G of K, E to the I K, Z minus I, H bar, K squared, T over 2 mu. So I've just done my arithmetic here. That's one term. And then the other term is plus an integral zero to infinity dK, not mu, but dK. G of K. And now we're going to have this term, F of theta C K, and then E to the I K R over R, and then E to the minus I H bar, K squared T over 2 mu. Okay, so that's what we're going to imagine our wave function is for large R. The top integral is the incident beam. It's not only the incident beam, but it's also most of the beam that goes right through the target and just down what's called, I guess, the beam line. And this is 
scattered way. By the way, one of the faculty members here who's now on earth is, although he's in remarkable shape, his latest sport is ice climbing. Um, apparently rock climbing was too boring. Um, anyway, I speak of him in the present. He may be dead now because of his new sport. But um, he uh, was either a graduate student or a postdoc at Slack, and uh, he actually put his head in the beam line. He didn't realize that the beam was on. <laughs> but fortunately, it wasn't in there too long. Showed him no sign of wear, although his hair was white um, 30 years ago, so maybe the beam did do something. All right, I'm looking for more space to write, so I guess I'll just take this board here. Um, is there any question? Remember, I've got a pocket full of chocolate that I um, moved from one of the vendors at the Biophysical Society of Chocolate. Um, and uh, of course, I also give out chocolate. Uh, this will be a new rule. I'm going to give out chocolate for pointing out mistakes that I make because um, I also make mistakes. Okay. So where are these um, Certainly, due to the value k0, which is the maximum of g of k, but what about z and t? What is the relation between z and t such that this integral is, is dominant? Well, it's, it's when z and t conspire to make this phase um, uh, stationary. And in other words, in, in particular, um, we want the derivative of this with respect to k to be 0 at k0. Zero. So we said 0 equals e by dk of, first of all, i k z minus i um, h bar k squared t over 2u. And this will be at k0. And this gives us i z minus i uh, h bar k zero t and u, which tells us that um, z is equal to h bar k zero over u times t, and so the velocity of the uh, incident wave then is h bar k zero over mu, which causes p over mu. So that stationary phase approximation tells us then that, the, that this thing can be described as a sort of lump of um, wave function that's moving with this speed along the z-axis toward the target. And in fact, um, most of it goes right through the target and um, continues on, goes through Byron Healy's head and so forth. Um, that's the guy's name. He's quite a good physicist, by the way. All right. Um, we want to do the same thing to this. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to write f of theta p and k as Parting slightly from my notes, e to the i alpha of theta p and k. And so we're again going to say this zero equals to e by dk of i alpha theta p k plus i k r 
minus i h bar k squared t over 2 u. And when we differentiate there, what we get is i alpha prime theta t k0 plus i r minus i h bar k over mu t. And so this tells us that r maximum, say, this tells us that z maximum, by the way, is h bar k0 t. Apart from a constant, of course, you could have an arbitrary overall phase, so there could be a z0 here, obviously. Then this rm, on the other hand, is minus alpha prime. Now I'm going to make this a subscript. So k0 theta t plus, and this is the group velocity times time, where vg is just the same thing, t over mu, or h bar k over mu. OK, so that's what we've got there. Are there any questions? All right. One, let me just, I don't want to emphasize this point, and so I was thinking of skipping it all together, but I think maybe I'll mention it briefly. So, in other words, what we've got here is we've got a plane wave that's basically like that, and then it's moving with vg, and then it hits the target, which, of course, if the plane wave has this extent, the target would actually, I think, be quite a bit bigger. Anyway, all right, so here's the target, say, and then we've got the particles going out in scattered waves in all sorts of directions, and so this is, well, actually, this is a terrible picture that I just drew, because this is before, if this thing is moving like this, and this is the target, then this is before, but at some point, it's going through the target, and these little waves are starting to come out, and then, so this is, say, t equal minus t, this is t approximately zero, and this one will be the scattered wave like this, and then the instrument beam aiming at teetering over here, so this is still going that way, and these guys are all going out. Okay, the one other thing is that what you could have done was you could have said that there was a potential here representing the target, or the interaction with the target, in other words, u of r, could be sort of, could be time dependent, and it could be zero when the particles are, when the beam bunch is way off to the left, and then as it gets close, you turn on the potential so that it has full strength by the time this hits the target, and then once the scattered beam leaves, 
and the incident beam leaves, and you turn the potential back to zero. So, and the, the, um, it's usually said that this, this should be done slowly, so you, it's, in fact, it's a little hard for me to see how this can really be done slowly, but on the other hand, if you imagine that this thing was way back here, then you can turn on the potential very slowly, get it to full strength before the beam hits, then once everything goes past, you then turn it back to zero slowly. So that's called the adiabatic observation. All right, I think we'll stop here. I'll just say a couple more things. Um, whenever I deal with, whenever I teach identical particles, I think of them as uh, just remarkably, um, the, the, well, what's remarkable is the idea is so simple. The connection between spin and statistics is tantalizing. And, um, and uh, the implications of the connection between spin and statistics are, um, they're both subtle and dramatic. That is to say, the, as we went through this discussion of the helium atom, um, everything was, I think, I hope, it was straightforward. But, um, but it's straightforward and also subtle, and then it has these dramatic um, consequences. And of course, there are many other contexts, physical contexts, in which the, uh, the implications of spin statistics are even more dramatic. Um, lasers, for example, uh, are possible because of the, um, because the photons and bosons, if they weren't bosons, and lasers. Um, so the chance of an atom emitting a photon with the same momentum and polarization as the incident photon uh, is increased because of the because the things are bosons like to be in the same state. Um, all right, I'll, I guess I'll stop. I don't know how you turn it off. No idea. Yeah, I don't use Windows, but I never use the program. Stop process. Stop.